What, what do you predict will emerge as some of the best opportunities? I mean, I think in the cross-border space, we're going to see completely different use cases being successful than the ones that we have seen in the kind of retail, domestic, open banking ecosystems that we've seen in the UK and Europe particularly. I mean, largely those use cases are focused not in large part, but mainly because of the regulation and the restrictions of the regulation around transactional account data, which, you know, I'm probably less enthusiastic than Simon about <laughs> some of the opportunities that that presents. But I think as we start to get into the cross-border space, we need to switch our vision towards things that genuinely can be attacked by that kind of cross-border open banking. And for me, that's really kind of trade finance and, and the kind of logistics space, supply chain management, but with finance, um, you know, and all roads back, you know, roads lead to lending. You know, that trade finance piece is is massive and I think can be can be really helped by some kind of global viewpoint on how open banking can support that. I think as well, when you look at, you know, what is it somewhere between five to 10% of the world live outside of the country that they were born. I'm one of those. Uh, I think remittance again, and tying remittance payments with, with data uh, will also be a massive use case. I suffer dramatically for not having that in, in uh, Belgium. Uh, I wish it would happen sooner, uh, but I think, you know, that's, that's definitely got a huge value proposition that isn't being tackled at the moment. Yep. I'm with you on that. David, what, what do you predict? Yeah, no, I, I think in terms of in a pure kind of pure cross-border sense, then I think it'd be payment-based opportunities mm -hmm. using the likes of the separate infrastructure. I think that that would be the basis of the rail where I can see a lot of kind of cross-border open banking driven activity coming from. I think in terms of from data, I think it will be harder. I think it'll be harder mm -hmm. to get data use cases working. Uh, but I think where it stands that the best chance is kind of where you can start with kind of the basics of the data, the, the kind of the, the consistent core of data use cases that are, are replicated in all markets. So whether that be around income verification, account owner verification, identity, identity services, I think those are the ones that will start being the use cases that will start going cross consistently across border first. I think the more sophisticated ones where you need to analyze and categorize data is harder. So I think data categorization from different sources is, is, a, is a really different act, difficult act to solve. <laughs> Maybe something for AI in the future. Simon, what, what are some of your uh, predictions? Probably a bit bonkers, so human. Um, we, we have a massive issue with financial inclusion in the UK and in the Western world. So we've got a lot of people in this country that they can have a bank account for. Really, they must spend 15 years of my life working in it. And I feel incredibly passionate about it. And I work with credit unions and all sorts of things because of it. Uh, I personally believe that the standards we have driven will give us the chance to change the way the credit scores are defined for citizens. I think the historical and the legacy way that we look at credit, which is basically on failure, so you can't get a business credit score unless you've got P&L published, which could be 19 months after your trading year. You can't get any personal data until you've failed payments or until you've made payments. We always work on failure data. If I take the open banking standards at the moment, we give a chance to give a real true view of people's financial health, which is cash flow. And every time you go to a bank, they don't ask you for your history. They ask you for a cash flow. Uh, if you're a business, you're going through those doors. Now, extrapolate that and take it further. There's a risk profile for these people that have got this particular um, demographic issue as well. And we've got low ones and higher ones as well. I think the interoperability piece after open banking gives us the chance for people to underwrite citizens in other countries and provide credit in different ways. I think mm -hmm. the biggest and highest benefit we will get from true interoperability, and as Lauren said before, it could be between just two countries or it could be between just two entities in two countries. It doesn't need to be a global thing. It allows us to service things differently because the risk appetite in one place might be wrong. The cash position might be different in another. might be a bit long and they're a bit short over there. That better ability of people's affordability, credit, I&E, whatever you want to call it, I think will open up lots and lots of opportunities. And I'll give you some real world ones as well. We're looking at Apple using open banking. Where did this start? It started in the UK. Okay. Just get your flag out. It started in the UK. You don't need to say anything else. That means that we got so much right because Apple, which is a, they operate in what, 79 countries around the world to sell their device and they launched on our standards. But are Apple going to launch a bank? No. They're going to go and do underwriting for devices. They're going to go and work out what you can afford from your device things. Now think about the value of that data. And then think about how transportable that data is across territories, but then think about the exchange of it as well. It's a little bit blotty, and, and I apologize for going a little bit outside the box, but I genuinely think that the purchases of goods and the underwriting of goods is something that interoperability creates, but it's at a micro level, it's at a citizen level, and I really hope it does, because it'd be great. 
I, I like that idea of a, a portable credit rating. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to look at. So Tom, you have a, you are going to close us out with the, with your predictions. Yeah. No, I, I love those ones. I think that's brilliant. And I, yeah, I really get that pain point. People move to new countries and, and, and the data just doesn't come with them. So a way of, mm -hmm. of bringing that is powerful. But I think even things like just cross-border P2P payments, you know, often even with some fantastic fintechs that solve for that exact problem, I think often a lot of manual data entry, um, you know, and quite can, can be quite a clunky process. So even things like big pay, payment initiation journeys, um, you know, cross border um, can be powerful stuff that that really makes people's lives that little bit easier. So I think that's that's exciting as well.